Welcome to today's webinar titled, Continuing Plunder, Brutal Extraction of Africa's Resources. My name is Jacques Bahati. I'm a policy analyst with the Africa Faith and Justice Network. I welcome you today as the chair of the Accountability Working Group of the Advocacy Network for Africa here in Washington, DC. The Accountability Working Group, which organized today's webinar, was established to create, shape, and lead the Advocacy Network for Africa's collaborative initiative to deploy accountability tools to contribute to eradicating century old and ongoing exploitation of Africa. So today's focus is the continuing plunder, brutal extraction of Africa's resources. It is about the pillaging, the exploitation, the extraction of natural resources, the corruption, the poaching of Africa's fish, all this must end. But how and who will make this happen? It is our hope that you will journey with us as we fight to make sure that we are the last generation to witness this painful theft of our riches. Thank you for joining us today. And we want to thank those who sacrificed time and, and any other uh, personal um, uh, pleasures to make this uh, event happen. For more on our work, you can email me at bahati at afgen.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mr. Eric Chinje, a visiting professor at George Mason University. Please, Eric, take it away. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jack, and I thank everybody, those I see and those I can on this um, uh, e platform. Um, we're going to go quickly. We don't. We have. We've got two hours, and uh, we want to, you know, stack a lot of things into the two hours. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you all and to be part of this um, uh, very important and I would even say amazing event. We all know that um, Africa is entering a complex, challenging, but I hope ultimately liberating uh, phase of its development. And here I'm talking about the African uh, continental free trade area, the single market. We are about to go into that and we need all the tools, all the resources we have. So there's need to singularly focus on what we actually have. And if what we have has been subject to centuries of exploitation, it may be time to completely rethink it, how we are managing those resources, God-given resources. So this program is going to focus on four of those areas. We're going to be focusing on mining, because of the extensive resources the continent has. We're gonna be focusing on oil and gas, and we all know that we, Africa is probably the second or the third most endowed region when it comes to oil and gas. We're gonna be talking about land. We know Africa if there's no land to talk about. And finally, uh, we're gonna be talking about fishing. Uh, these are four critical resources that the continent has to reconfigure its use of and management of those resources. Um, we're going to start off with our friend, Dr. Nimo Basi, who is in Nigeria, one of the countries that has had where the exploitation of oil and gas has the most impact. Impact in terms of resources it made available to the country, but more importantly, to external actors. Impact in terms of the environment and the amount of destruction and the lives that were destroyed as a result of that. Um, we will try to connect to Nemo 
you should be in an area which has um, where the the where the the, the the problems are not only visible but can bring home to all of us exactly what we're talking about. So Nemo, if you can hear us, um, Dr. Nemo is director and founder of the Health of uh, Mother Earth Foundation. And if you can add some more information, great, I can see you um, uh, on the screen. So if you can add some information about yourself, that would be fantastic. But please, let's get on with it. Tell us about um, um, you know this, this sucking of Africa's um, oil and gas. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for me to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, I'm on the move. Uh, I'm on a field trip uh, with uh, friends from Oil Watch International from across the continent and from outside Africa. And we just, we'll be just be going around Ogoni land to see the depth of oil pollution that has been left here since uh, oil extraction was stopped by the local peak communities in 1993. And we all must have heard about the very serious uh, the repression that followed that action by the communities, uh, which also included the execution of Ken Salawiwa on 10th November, 1995. Uh, the interesting thing is that since that time, since 1993, the oil wells have been shut down, they've not been reopened. And I'm just going to take my photo off so that I can uh, manage the, the bandwidth that I have. Uh, if, if, uh, if I have another opportunity when I get to a location where I headed, then I can show you photos from, of the pollution that has remained, even though all extraction activities stopped so many years ago. Now, all extraction began in Nigeria in commercial quantities in 1958 at a place called Oloibri. Now that oil well number one was drilled in 1956 and is now designated a monument. And I think that is very appropriate because it's a monument to irresponsibility. It's a monument to destructive extraction. It's a monument that really, really shows how bad things can go. And um, oil extraction some people may say has brought a lot of wealth to Nigeria, but nothing has trickled down to the people. It's brought immense destruction, immense pollution. And the Ogoni example is very emblematic because in 2011, the United Nations Environment Program issued a report of the assessment of Ogoni environment. And this should be a lesson to all the countries on the continent uh, who are celebrating the oil fines in their territories and who believe that they could and some income from, from this resource. Now, since, the, since oil became a major income earner for Nigeria in the early 1970s, it has locked in undemocratic uh, manner of government. If at that time, it fed the military regime and kept them on and off in power for 30 years. Uh, but even after the civilian democracy returned in 1999, we've had massive repression accompanying the destruction of uh, this kind of this uh, fast fossil uh, reserves. So whole communities uh, uh, sat, demolished, uh, bombed, and now um, on the average, Nigeria has had one Exxon Valdez amount of oil spill every year for over 60 years. You can just imagine the depth of degradation that has happened. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, the National Agency for Detecting Oil Spills and Responding to Them reported uh, that there were 1,300 oil spills, coming to an average of five oil spills on a daily basis. Now, that is an incredible amount of spillage to think about. But this is not just oil. As we speak right now, there's an oil spill ongoing somewhere in Niger Delta. Now, some, this has not been in the news much because uh, these are the back of somewhere that is not so attractive to the international media. So this kind of environmental irresponsibility by transnational oil corporations, Shell, Chevron, Exxon, uh, Total, uh, Eni, and the rest, they, they just be completely behaving in a way that can be characterized as environmental racism in this part of the world. And 
there are so many reasons for us to worry about this. We, we don't really see where uh, oil has brought about an added value to our economy. Oil, or the oil business, petroleum business employs only 1%, less than 1% of Africa's workforce. And this report can be found, in, these figures can be found in a report called, um, uh, called, um, uh, <laughs> it just left, I just forgot what the title of that, that report is. But, um, but you can mm -hmm. find, there's a report that shows that um, only less than 1% of Africans uh, uh, found in the, uh, found their way employed by the sector. And then secondly, it's important mm -hmm. to note that 95% uh, or above of the investment in this sector takes place outside of Africa. 95% of the investment in the petroleum sector of what carries, what is actually being uh, implemented on the continent happens outside of the continent. And this is because uh, the fabrication of the oil, the rigs, mm -hmm. the floating and storage operation stations, they are all done offshore and brought uh, to the continent. And this shows clearly why this mm -hmm. sector is not adding much value to our local economy. And, and actually, as the world moves away from petroleum resources, if Africa continues to dig into it, we're going to end up with a lot of stranded assets, not just stranded assets, we're going to end up with also stranded communities. Um, in, in Nigeria, in particular, the oil corporations responding to the shift away from, um, from, shift away from crude oil, uh, beginning to divest from onshore oil wells. Uh, a company like Shell is selling off uh, some of its uh, oil wells onshore and planning to move to deeper waters. The report I was trying to mention earlier that shows data about the terrible situation that the sector is in is called Skies, Skies Limit Africa, published by Oil Change International in conjunction with Oil Watch, Home Health, and other groups. Uh, so if you can search for that, you will find a lot of information that is really heartbreaking. And so I was mentioning about Shell moving offshore. They're moving offshore because they don't want to be held accountable for the degradation onshore. And so they're moving offshore to where there'll be less regulation, less monitoring. And they're moving offshore because the deeper they go offshore, the less they pay as royalties to the Nigerian state. Nigeria even has better joint venture arrangement with this corporation. In some other African countries, the governments get little or nothing, except the pollution, the devastation, the land grabbing, the displacement of communities, and the horrible impacts of oil spills. I talked about oil spills at the UNEP report in Ogoni land, it was found that the water, the groundwater, surface water was contaminated right across the carriage. And soils were contaminated up to a depth of five meters. As I move around the locations today to check the work being done in trying to remedy, remediate the environment, we find that some, in some areas, the pollution has actually gone down as far as 10 meters, 10 meters, which means that this pollution don't disappear. They sink deeper when they are left, they're left on their own. And we can see this happening in many spots across the continent. The situation is not, it's not any better in South Sudan. It's not any better uh, in anywhere else that uh, oil is uh, in Angola or other areas. And now where we're worried about this also is the issue of justice and not just resource justice, but just the cl climate justice. Africa has contributed less than three percent of the Hello. carbon stock in the Nemo? atmosphere. Can you hear me? Yes, we have. Right, okay, so I just... Yes, I was going to urge you to, to wrap up, just, you know, in give, give us a key sentence that eases you out and then we will we'll continue. And I hope we'll be able to come back to you with questions. We've uh, taken up a lot of our time. Uh, right, thank you so much. Um, and I thank you for sharing the slides uh, that kind of illustrate some of the things I was saying. Uh, yeah. well, the takeaway for Africa is one that the oil sector business is actually a dead end because the world is moving away from that. And the price of oil, the price of a barrel of oil has gone so low that countries like Nigeria have to depend on borrowing extensively to meet up budgetary requirements. So new opening like in a place like Namibia, in Botswana and other countries, 
and the East African oil pipeline from Uganda to Tanzania, uh, they're just investments to feed, uh, for the moment, the needs of external territories. And I think it's time for us to look for uh, resources that will build an integrated economy of the continent uh, that actually involves our labor force and involves the development of techniques uh, using indigenous knowledge and other knowledge on the continent rather than following a pattern that brings nothing but degradation. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. We'll come back to you with some questions and we hope that um, in the process, you'll also hint on these renewable resources which Africa seems to have in great abundance. Uh, you did say that um, um, oil and gas will drive sustainable growth in Africa. You know, one of your, your slides said that. Well, I'd like to zero in on that. But before we do that, let's, we'll have to yes. go to the next uh, speaker. And that's, um, uh, it's going to be uh, Faith Alube from Kenya. I hope you're with us, uh, Faith. And you're the executive director of the Kenya Land Alliance. And I emphasize the word land because if we can't control our land, we control nothing else. So over to you, uh, Faith, if you're with us already. Um, is Faith there? I think I saw an indication that she was. Are you there, Faith? Um, okay, Faith, apparently we've lost the connection. Let's, we've lost the connection to Faith. We will just very quickly come back to you and we're lucky to still have you, Nemo. Um, I want you to address and I, I, I recognize the fact that our other speaker, Alain Foucault, is with us. So that's wonderful. Alain, bonjour. We'll come to you shortly. But let me go back to Nemo and um, ask you know, the question I, I threw out about uh, um, the claim that oil and gas would you know, help Africa attain sustainable development. But more importantly, how do we, how do we keep that, build on that, but also uh, tap into the renewable resources that Africa seems to have in great abundance. And you know, I'm thinking about solar energy, wind energy, and hydraulic energy. Um, Nemo? Uh, yes, thank you so much for having me back. Um, actually, this, this slide that says African would drive development from oil and gas uh, was quoting what some leaders in the African Union have said. I don't believe that at all. Uh, because oil and gas, um, I've, I've, from what I've seen, the only nation where who can say they benefited from this resource is Norway. Uh, and and they, there are many reasons why that happened. Uh, about labor organization, the technology, because of the shipping uh, development in my development, but even for Scott or what we call in Nigeria stockfish, maybe all mm -hmm. Africans call it the same thing, uh, they are actually fighting so much to stop all extraction continuing in, or even happening in their territory. So I think the debate for Africa is renewable. We have ample wind, we have ample uh, more than 12 hours of sunlight every day, more or less, so, so to speak. This is the area of the continent because we also would not depend on the national grid. The uh, national grid to reach some of our... Please go on. Our remote locations would be very expensive and now where we can uh, do... Government. We provide environment and reach all up. Okay. People have been on the move, as I said, and speak. Um, Dr. Basi, I think we, we the, the, the sound is very intermittent and we may be losing you. Um, I know you're still there. Please come back in when you, if you need to, uh, we will uh, allow room for that. Let, just allow me to go on to another speaker who's on the ground, and this is these are the difficulties of uh, 
uh, the technology for those who are on the ground uh, away from um, their offices and homes. Um, Alain Foka uh, is with us. He's uh, in Cameroon, uh, uh, from what I understand, he's always on the road. I never know where Alain is, but apparently he's currently in Cameroon and driving between the two main cities, Douala and Yaoundé. Um, I will call on Alain to address another area of, another resource area that needs to be, that we really need to you know, focus on, and these are Africa's um, immense mineral wealth. Um, uh, from gold to diamonds and coltan and, and you name it, uh, uranium and so on. So Alain, Alain is going to be speaking in French. We'll have um, Cathy, Cathy in Congo, who will translate and um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll play between the two languages. Africa has to figure out how to do this, not only between French and English, but also this, uh, uh, you know, Arabic and Portuguese and so on. So anyway, Alain, um, Bonjour, mon cher frère. Et, euh, je sais que tu es entre Douala et Yaoundé. Je sais que euh, euh, je, je te donne la parole maintenant pour nous parler de, de ce problème de, 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 de l'exploitation de, 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 de la richesse minérale de, de, du continent. Alors... Salut Eric, ça me fait plaisir de t'avoir. Je suis effectivement sur la route entre Yaoundé, entre Yaoundé et, et, et Douala. Et j'aurais voulu être dans le confort de mon bureau pour parler de ça. Et le sujet m'intéresse à plusieurs titres. À plusieurs titres parce que je fais depuis quelque temps un documentaire sur l'exploitation minière en Afrique. J'ai commencé par l'industriel, puis ensuite l'artisanal. Et la difficulté que l'on rencontre, c'est de se rendre compte que plus de 60 ans après ce qu'on a appelé les indépendances, nous, nous ne possédons pas nos minéraux. Ça reste quelque chose qui est endormi dans nos esprits. On se dit c'est là, mais on ne sait pas de quoi il s'agit. Et la démarche est de dire à un moment donné, oui, on ne va pas développer nos pays que par les minéraux, mais peut-être que si la nature ou Dieu, chacun dira comme il veut, nous a donné un tel cadeau, il est, le moment, il est venu le moment de s'en approprier, de se le reprendre, puisque c'est les autres qui en bénéficient. Et ce que j'ai vu à RDC, ce que j'ai vu au, au, au Mali, ce que j'ai vu en Côte d'Ivoire, ce que j'ai vu dans pas mal de pays africains, en Centrafrique, me rend malade parce qu'en réalité, les autres s'enrichissent sur ce que nous possédons. Seulement, mon message n'est pas de venir ici dire, voilà, les autres nous volent, les autres nous volent, puisqu'on a tellement dit ça que même le gosse le plus attardé sait qu'aujourd'hui, nous faisons l'objet d'exploitation de tout ce que nous possédons. J'ai plutôt envie de passer un message en disant, une fois qu'on a posé le diagnostic, une fois qu'on est conscient que ce sont les autres qui exploitent les richesses qui nous appartiennent, Qu'est-ce qu'on fait Et c'est là où je, je vais être un peu dur peut-être, mais c'est le fond de ma pensée, vous me pardonnerez d'être un peu dur. C'est là où j'estime que ce qu'on appelle l'intelligence africaine est fortement responsable. Je compare toujours ça à quelque chose de simple. Vous avez dans votre maison vos richesses avec votre famille qui vit. Quelqu'un vient chaque jour de l'extérieur pour prendre vos richesses. À aucun moment, vous vous réunissez pour dire comment on fait pour qu'il ne rentre plus chez nous pour prendre cette richesse. L'Afrique est riche de son intelligence. Quand on fait le tour du monde, et lorsque je travaille dessus, Eric, tu le sais, je fais des documentaires sur les Africains dans le monde, on est la communauté la plus diplômée aujourd'hui. Malheureusement, on est plus diplômé que intelligent, on va dire ça comme ça. On est plus diplômé qu'intellectuel, j'allais dire. Qu'est-ce qui fait qu'à aucun moment nous nous organisions pour pouvoir récupérer nos richesses, pour pouvoir au moins investir dans ce domaine, pour pouvoir au moins prendre un pan, un petit pan, les services artisanal de ces richesses minières dont nous parlons tout le temps. Au Congo, vous arrivez, il y a tout à RDC. Mais même dans le domaine artisanal, c'est pris par des gens qui prennent sur eux de partir de Chine, venir investir un tout petit peu et possèdent l'immense richesse en corse artisanale en, en, en RDC. Est-ce que la diaspora ne peut pas travailler 
à élever des fonds sur le marché pour au moins commencer petitement à récupérer l'aspect artisanal pendant que l'on se bat pour l'aspect industriel. Est-ce que cette jeunesse qui a conscience qu'elle est aujourd'hui spoliée ne devrait pas travailler à unir les forces, quelles que soient les nationalités, les nationalités africaines, pour qu'il y ait un consortium, pour qu'il y ait un, un fonds, j'en sais rien, je ne suis pas spécialiste de la finance, pour commencer au moins à s'investir dans l'artisanal, qui représente, pour, ne serait-ce que pour le cas du Congo, 30% de cette immense richesse minérale. C'est un peu ça le message que j'ai envie d'avoir. Ne pas passer le temps à dire, oui, on nous vole. La chanson, on la connaît déjà. Ne pas penser, passer le temps à faire juste le diagnostic, à montrer ce qu'il y a, qu'est-ce qui fait qu'on ne s'organise pas pour au moins toucher à ce qui n'est pas encore volé par la grande petite Oui. Je vais... ah. Oui. Ce n'est pas pour vous interrompre, mais je vais demander à, 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 à Cathy de résumer. Vous, tu as, ah, vous avez une chose d'une importance capitale. Je vais demander à Cathy, donc, de résumer rapidement ce que vous avez dit. Euh, et puis, euh, je suis sûr qu'il y aura beaucoup de questions. On va essayer de, de, de prendre ces questions et puis euh, vous permettre de respecter un petit peu. Uh, Cathy, um, can you capture in summary form uh, the, the, what Alain has been saying? Yes, Eric, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Alain was actually saying that he's very interested in the subject uh, regarding the, the brutal exploitation of the continent, the African continent's mineral wealth. Uh, according to him, uh, we know the, the gospel of complaining that pointing at others that they have been exploiting the, the wealth of Africa. He's asking many questions about why, for example, uh, in DRC, in Mali, in Ivory Coast, in Central African Republic, Uh, why, uh, why is the African diaspora not raising, I mean, the awareness or even raising funding uh, in the international market to sponsor at least the, uh, the, 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 uh, not the industrial fact, the industrial side of that business, but even the, how can I say it? The, 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 artisanal, uh, the artisanal area of the market, because he said that it's a huge business, but it doesn't understand why the African uh, who are so uh, renowned to be intelligent are not using their intelligence to put and put it in put it to work to actually honor to build ownership of their of their of the of their, of this mining industry because he said that is uh, he's sick of what he's seeing because he's preparing a documentary on this uh, on this topic and he's uh, tired of the gospel of complaining or pointing at fingers at others but he wants the youth he wants the youth to be aware of their responsibility. He wants the, intelligent, the African intelligentsia to be aware of its responsibility and want them to organize themselves and, and, be, and mobilize themselves against it and find solutions. I think uh, he raised many questions at the end of his uh, remarks. Uh, I think we can come back to that. Why is, for example, why is the African diaspora not raising funds on the international market, at least to seize the artisanal side of the market? And why can't the youth uh, create like a consortium To get uh, to get a, a hold on that business and to get ownership of their own future because it's their future that we are talking about here. Alain, uh, if I miss a point, just add. Yeah, thank you very much. We we have. Je voudrais résumer une chose qui est importante et que je voudrais. Je choisis parler en français parce que j'estime qu'il ne faut pas qu'une partie aussi soit exclue et qu'on ne doit pas entrer dans la bataille des. des qui est accessoire. Mais le plus important, c'est de dire à un moment donné, et je voudrais qu'elle le répète, nous avons beaucoup de diplômés dans tous les domaines. C'est connu aujourd'hui. Mm -hmm. Mais il faut transformer les diplômés en intellectuels. On a passé beaucoup de diplômes, il faudrait peut-être qu'on commence à être pratique. Et c'est ça que je reproche à notre intelligentsia. Voilà. Qu'on devienne pratique, concret, en faisant des choses pour récupérer, pas juste la complainte. Voilà. Cathy, Cathy. What uh, exactly what Alain is trying to say is that uh, we have a lot of graduates in every in all fields, but we are not pragmatic. We are not pragmatic, and we are we are we are not getting a hold. We are not we are not get, building ownership of our own uh, destiny. Alain, am I right? 
I think it's that, yes. You're right. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask Alain, um, who has, you know, who's done some amazing documentaries on this subject, especially in in the DRC, but he's done, you know, uh, um, he's done quite a lot of work on this. And uh, the one question I want to ask him is uh, if there was anything he saw on the ground, either from the policy front in terms of what the leaders, the leadership of the country, or the DRC, for example, in terms of what the leadership is thinking, or what people on the ground, citizens, are doing. Is there anything he saw that gives us hope? Alain, just, je suis sûr que vous avez compris la question. Absolument. La première chose que j'ai envie de dire, c'est que quand on rencontre les autorités, les autorités donnent l'impression d'être dépassées. Pour eux, il y a trop de pouvoir derrière, trop de choses derrière qu'ils ne peuvent pas maîtriser. Et comme dirait très souvent, nos dirigeants ont peur des grandes puissances, toutes les entreprises qui arrivent donnent l'impression qu'elles sont envoyées par les grandes puissances. Donc, elles ne réagissent pas. Elles ont peur. Or, quand vous allez sur le terrain, vous voyez la misère des gens. Ce n'est pas pour faire la promo de mon, de mon document, mais quand vous arrivez, il y a la traite négrière encore dans nos pays autour de la mine artisanale. Alors, j'ai dit aux autorités, peut-être qu'il faut d'abord vous concentrer sur l'artisanal, puisque vous avez peur des grandes firmes, je peux citer des noms, Glencore et compagnie, qui sont des grandes firmes internationales, où on se dit, elles sont trop puissantes. Concentrez-vous sur l'artisanal. Mais l'artisanal est tenu par des petites entreprises chinoises. Et il a fallu un peu secouer le cocotier, un peu faire ce document. L'État chinois a reculé en disant à ces entreprises de revenir, d'arrêter d'être dans l'illégalité. Et c'est ça qui est important. Or, les populations en ont marre, marre d'être exploitées dans leur propre pays. Quand vous descendez, vous voyez des gens dans les mines. Je suis descendu à 120 mètres dans les mines en profondeur. Et les gens disent, est-ce que vous voyez ce qu'on vit Qu'attendaient les autorités pour prendre en main cela. Et les autorités ont décidé en DRC de créer une société qui va acheter les minéraux aux populations. Mais depuis qu'ils ont créé la société, elle n'existe toujours pas. Elle ne fait rien. Ils ont peur. Donc, il y a la peur chez les autorités qui estiment que, bon, c'est un domaine qui est tenu par les grandes puissances. Mais moi, je trouve ça totalement ridicule. Totalement ridicule. Mais en même temps, les autorités vous disent, vous de la diaspora, pourquoi vous ne venez pas pour prendre des mines On vous les donnera, les mines, si vous venez avec une entreprise. Et c'est vrai, personne ne vient. Non, on va dire. C'est ça la réalité. Cathy, uh, uh, do you want to translate that, please? Thank you, Eric. Thank, sorry. Uh, Alain just raised three or four main points. Uh, the first one, he was uh, telling us that when he meets with the, the governments, with uh, uh, public authorities in many African countries, he, is, uh, he feels that uh, they are overwhelmed. They complain that they can't do anything because they are afraid of, uh, of uh, the world, I mean, the Western uh, uh, countries, I mean, the powerful countries in the world. So, um, and also even when a company, a mining company uh, arrives in any of those countries, they feel like those companies are coming, are bringing the power of those great uh, uh, countries to, to the African countries. So uh, 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 public um, uh, officials in Africa are just like afraid to, to take control of that. He also said that uh, uh, he, he noticed like a form of slave trade in many places where he's been to. And this is, it makes him sad to see that uh, many communities are still being awfully exploited and uh, Chinese uh, uh, workers are all over the place invading their artisanal mining sector. And then uh, finally, he took the example of DRC, where the government created a company on the paper, but that company is still not uh, 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 in, in a, I mean, in, it's still not working, it's still not, uh, I mean, operate, operational. So he's afraid that uh, we go over the same thing over and over. And uh, government is also, those African government are also asking what the African diaspora is doing about it. So they expect the di African diaspora to come back and uh, with and bring some uh, some companies and funding and and take control uh, take ownership of the, the mining sector, especially the artisanal uh, side of the the business. 
Alain, please, if I'm a mistake, if I say anything wrong, please correct me. No, you are okay. It's okay. Right. You're doing well. Uh, I want to ask Alain a final question, and it is about uh, which it's coming from uh, both um, uh, Enoch and uh, Jacques. And it has to do with whether the leaders you've interviewed, Alain, and you've interviewed a lot of them, are they conscious of the levels of poverty, especially in those uh, areas where these minerals are found? Are they fully conscious of it, like in Chad, for example, in the DRC? Um, and um, okay, uh, that's my question, Alan. I was just trying to reformulate it. Le, 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 le drame, c'est que pas mal de ces dirigeants sont conscients de la pauvreté des populations, de la misère qui règne. Et ce qui m'a frappé, c'est que quand j'ai montré les images, je ne veux pas citer le nom de ces deux chefs d'État, il, il y en a deux qui ont pleuré, qui ont versé une larme en voyant la misère des gens, en voyant dans quelles conditions ces gens la vivent. Et lorsque vous discutez avec eux, ils vous disent, montrez ça aux grandes puissances qu'ils voient ce qu'ils font. Et moi, je, je réponds en disant, c'est vous qui avez la responsabilité de ces états. Mmh. C'est vous qui devez les amener à comprendre cela. Mais vous verrez, dans le documentaire, il y en a un qui se plaint en disant, nous dénonçons la gouvernance mondiale. Parce que on a le sentiment qu'ils n'en ont rien à faire de notre pauvreté. Maintenant, c'est nous, société civile, de mon point de vue, nous, diaspora, nous, ce qu'on appelle les intellectuels, qui devons oublier un peu les dirigeants puisqu'ils sont les bras liés, ils sont les mains liées, et montrer le monde. C'est nous qui sommes à Washington, qui sommes à Paris, qui sommes à Londres, qui devons prendre la main parce que si vous avez des chefs qui sont aussi dépendants, qui sont aussi fragiles, nous qui sommes moins fragiles parce que nous travaillons, parce que nous vivons dans un environnement qui est différent, nous devons venir chercher pour montrer aux yeux du monde l'injustice. Mais en même temps, nous devons nous organiser. Parce qu'on a beau discuter, c'est très bien les rencontres que nous faisons, mais on ne peut pas montrer les entreprises que nous avons montées pour aller récupérer des parts de marché dans cet environnement qui est le nôtre. C'est notre richesse. Et nous nous mettons dans nos bureaux, nous nous plaignons, on dénonce, on accuse les chefs d'État. On sait qu'ils sont mauvais, ce n'est pas aujourd'hui qu'on le découvre. Maintenant, nous, que faisons-nous très concrètement Est-ce qu'au sortir de ce webinaire, on peut se dire on se retrouve à 20 et on va à la recherche des fonds pour aller prendre des mines de coltan, des mines de cobalt, des mines d'or en DRC ou au Mali ou en Centrafrique Là, on sera concret. Maintenant, les, les, les forums, on peut les multiplier. Si c'est juste pour discuter, ça n'a aucun intérêt. C'est ça mon point de vue. Ça peut choquer un certain nombre de personnes, mais je pense comme ça. Merci infiniment, euh, Alain. Mais il ne faut pas, ne vous, vous éloignez pas de nous parce que euh, il faut enfin, <rire> circuler, mais en écoutant quand même, on va revenir euh, vers vous avec des questions. Uh, so Alain, essentially, um, uh, pointed. Oh, Cathy, please, why don't you take this? You can go ahead, Eric. <laughs> well, right. I mean, uh, Alain, Alain was pointing at the... to the need for global that the leaders he has yes. spoken. I mean, and it's amazing that he said this. That the leaders he spoke, he, you know, he's taken images of, you know, he goes around filming a lot of these things. He's taken images to some of the uh, leaders in Africa, and some have actually shed tears seeing what they're seeing. So evidence, obviously, that they've not been to those places um, where they need to go to. But Alain said they tend to denounce global governance on the issues. So uh, obviously, they believe that uh, that's where the solution should be coming from. But he has also told them, each time he's interviewed them, that they should be the ones who, 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 who pick this up. And his emphasis now is on the diaspora. The diaspora needs to organize itself. That's the central, his central message. Somehow we've got to figure out how the diaspora helps connect to the people who live in these, um, uh, in these uh, mineral rich areas and help them uh, be part of the process of the, of the, uh, of the production chain. Um, Alain will be with us, he's driving, but I've urged him to, to, to stay connected if he can, and we'll come back to him with questions that we may have. 
Um, I suppose I can now call on Faith. I want to see if Faith is around and uh, if she is, it looks like she is. So um, Faith, thank you for uh, connecting and um, you're the um, executive director of the Kenya Land Alliance. Uh, Kenya is one country that has had uh, an amazing, incredible experience also with the land issues. Um, even though what is happening on the continent now pales, I mean, uh, the, the situation in Kenya pales in comparison to what's happening in, on the continent right now with um, in Madagascar, in, 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 in um, Mozambique, in Cameroon, countries where China and others are just coming and talking about land grab, they're grabbing the land and in other countries. So um, uh, um, Faith Alube, uh, Executive Director, it's over to you. Please tell us about the, not only the Kenya, the Kenya uh, situation, but the whole problem of land management in Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Indeed, um, it's such an opportunity. Apologies, I could not uh, log on earlier. I had uh, Wi-Fi issues and I'm out in the bush somewhere called Taita Taveta. It's like six hours from the capital city. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and I'd like to talk about the ongoing land grab, not only in Kenya, but of course, the continent. And all this is tied into resource um, extraction and, and the resource cast, so to speak. So I had shared my PowerPoint with Lydia. I'll start with Kenya and give case studies about Kenya, and then we can expand the, the conversation. Yeah, the continuing Rwanda. So I'd like to do some, some little bit of history because Big Brother Nee told me to talk a little bit about land and the land justice question in Kenya before we um, expand the discussion. We can go on, Lydia. We go on. Yeah, so our story as Kenya started in 1895 uh, when the colonialists were heading to Uganda to find out the source of River Nile and they passed through this beautiful nation and they called it Kenya and then they colonized it. When they colonized it on June 9, 1895, we became tenants at will of the British East African protestorate. Uh, for us, I think I was not. I was. I was not back. I can only imagine how people back then felt. But they were this free community, this free society. Then all of a sudden, there are these pieces of legislation that they didn't even understand that are being imposed on them. In 1890, between 1890, 1897 and 1902, um, the British uh, uh, masters, colonial masters were giving incentives to settlers from the UK, 2000 pounds to be exact, to come settle in this beautiful uh, place that they found um, raw materials, free labor, almost free labor. And, um, the natives are not that uh, powerful, so they can come and be colonized. So between 1897 and 1902, there are certain pieces of legislation that were introduced in order to make sure that they take over the most productive lands in the White Highlands, in the central of Kenya and along the coastal strip. Between 1904 and 1920, the British introduced a policy to settle Africans into reserves, the, the, the natives into reserves, in essence, adding uh, Kenyans into um, a sort of a village, a sort of setting where they made sure that whoever is in the village initially uh, did not have to pay tax, which had been introduced by the Crown Ordinance of 1890. Nine and the Crown Ordinance of 1897. So they made sure that outside the villages or the reserves, lives were a little bit uh, tough. And then if you are in the reserve, then you are offered some form of uh, compensation when you work uh, on the plantation of the colonial administrator. So this led to, um, it was a divide and rule tactic because uh, the natives then brought out the differences out of the natives instead of um, the natives uh, sticking together. What they did is that now they started looking at their differences. You are a different ethnic tribe, um, you are preferred, um, and the unhealthy competition brought about uh, um, 
a lot of problems like the spotter problem in the coast, uh, where, which still exists. There are some of these issues that are cyclic and they still exist. Right now uh, in Kenya, I'll be going back and forth so that you understand the plunder. Right now in Kenya, there are still squatters. Um, I wonder how someone can be told they're squatting on their indigenous land where their forefathers were buried, but it happens and they're called squatters. This is something that started in 1904 with the introduction of the policy, land policy, retrogressive, retrogressive land policy by the British administrators. From 1918 onwards, there was forceful and violent displacement of the natives to pave way for multinationals that I'm going to talk about a bit later again, because they are the agents of impunity in, in the year 2021. Uh, some of the communities that were violently um, evicted include the Telai, Pokot, Tukana, Kikuyu, and Sabot. Most of us know the Mau Mau, most of them were coming from central Kenya. And they were from the Kikuyu community. Um, the Unilever case that had been addressed by the UN Security Council addressed the land that had been, has been taken away from, from the Talai and the Pokot. And the Turkana, uh, uh, the communities that live around the oil and gas uh, um, uh, project um, in the north of Kenya, where um, the, the colonial administrator said it is idle land and unproductive. So uh, such uh, an example of such multinationals include Unilever, uh, with their active to date, Kakuzi Limited, uh, which is owned 55.5%. Um, Seven percent of Kakuzi Limited is owned by Camellia PLC. Camellia PLC has very powerful uh, uh, board members who um, we can even say have direct contact uh, to the powers that be in the UK. Let's go on, Lydia. So um, after, after, after the multinationals came into the picture, there was land alienation creation of reserves, I've spoken about it. Then there was this um, very tough, strict, and cruel uh, colonial administrator called Maurice Carter. Maurice Carter uh, was the head of a commission that was looking into historical, uh, how land can be alienated to benefit the colonial master. So some of the recommendations from this Carter Commission report included that um, the included that the locals, the natives have enough land of the unproductive idle land that they've been uh, given that's enough. They should use that land well. So the settlers still continued encouraging some more settlers to come from Britain, to come and settle on the White Islands and, and, and up to date, up to date in a, in a place called Lycipia. Um, and, and it's an example I'll give, 90% um, of the land owned in that area, it's owned, it's owned by communities or by families that have uh, that were given those lands in the 1920s in Kenya. There was this talking: uh, Africans who live in reserves do not did not need their livestock, despite depending on on them for livelihoods. There was a change of social and cultural norms. Um, there was an introduction of female circumcision as a form of subjugating um, uh, women back then. Um, they, there was the mushrooming of independent Christian churches. And we know how churches can be used to, to it's the opium of the masses. They can be misused as well. And then there's the impact of the World War I. The soldiers who went for war came back and they were more enlightened and they started uh, sensitizing uh, fellow natives, like, you know what, uh, we can fight for our land because by then there were only two major problems in Kenya, um, the issue of uh, freedom and land. Those were the two issues that Kenya started fighting for. That is what led to the uh, resistance and the agitation. So when we're talking about agitation, there are some very retrogressive policies that uh, were introduced, like um, in, natives used to live in reserves and then in exchange offer uh, free labor to, to or, very, or labor at a very minimal wage to, to the colonial administrator. And in exchange, they'd live in the reserves. The colonial administrator, I'm calling them generally because they, they, they took away 
all the productive lands. There was the introduction of trade union where uh, the natives tried to organize and, 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 and just get their voices heard and amplified. But of course, um, uh, the colonial administrators would have none of that. Then there was the political protest, and that is the emergence of political parties and, and, and movements, liberation movements, like the Mao Mao, Samoiko um, the, the the colonial era leader whose head um, is still in a museum somewhere in the UK. Uh, there was a movement in the coast called the Mekatini Liwa Menza uh, movement. All these liberation movements were fighting for two things, freedom and land, which had been taken away from them. And then there was the new immigration of the Europeans, as I've said. There was the preferential treatment of Europeans, as I've said. Then there's the quota issue that came in because when, when they took up the reproductive, when they took up the productive, sorry, the productive lands, um, the Africans or the natives that were living on those lands were displaced. Um, if they were not uh, herded into a reserve, um, they had to go squat somewhere else, especially on European farms. So uh, they were not recognized by the system. So because they were not recognized by the system, because they were not registered in a reserve, they were not hired by an European, so they were squatting. When you're a squatter, you took what you were given, and they preferred that uh, that arrangement because when you are, you're not recognized by the system, then you take what you have given. Lydia? So after the, after the agitation period, before I, I, I go into the case studies and I'm going to go into Mao Mao a little bit. After the agitation period of 1945 and the recommendations of the Qatar report, um, um, and Africa uh, were really- I'm, yes. Liz, I'm sorry to, you know, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to say, you know, we'd have to accelerate this because we really squeeze yes. for, so please go ahead. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll just show you how cyclic it is because I don't think Kenya we are free and I don't think we have the land that the Mau Mau went to the forest to fight. So after the agitation, there was a state of emergency that was declared in 1952 to 1963. During that period is when there was an emergence of very serious movements like the Mau Mau. So it was a matter of freedom and land. And um, the Mao Mao, the, 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 that movement was banned. Actually, people know it as the Mao Mao, but the real name is the Kenya Land and Freedom Army. The Kenya Land and Freedom Army was banned until 2003 when President Kibaki came in in Kenya. And when it was, it was unproscribed, um, the Kenya Human Rights Commission, back then I was an officer of the Kenya Human Rights Commission, um, we went, we took that case to the Royal Court of Justice and, and we were we were we pushed for the for the narrative that you know uh, it was a colonial legacy to mistreat and punish and ill treatment and 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 treat natives with such a in such a cruel manner it was a government it was a queen's policy it was the queen it was a state policy and some of the issues that were brought up and i'm going to show you some of the photos before i i share this plunder some of the issues that were brought up back then was the issue of jurisdiction, the issue of liability, the issue of time limitation, that 50 years after independence, um, the natives cannot go back to the perpetrator and say that um, uh, the perpetrator, the UK government is responsible for the injustices that were meted out to people during the emergency period. But of course, there's the definition of a human rights abuse and why it's not limited to time or space. So the Mau Mau case, I wonder if it was a success considering that only 5,228 uh, liberation heroes managed to get some form of token while they were in their millions because most of them were displaced back then. So how does plunder happen in Kenya right now? There's the tallow oil. And if you can see the picture where one of our dailies is talking about the big lie, Tallow Oil is a UK oil firm. And right now they slapped the Kenyan government with a bill of 204 billion. I think that is like $204 million. And we can't see the oil. That is a case study. It is current. So we're wondering what, 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 where is the, it is the cost of oil, but where is the oil? That is the same with what they used to do back in the colonial era where 
um, the multinationals used to be given land and incentives to come to Kenya. Let's move on, Lydia. Uh, there is um, a second one uh, called Kakuzi. Kakuzi is where Camellia owns 55.7% and Camellia has been uh, associated with the queen herself. Uh, Kakuzi, there is a decision made by the um, uh, most of the courts in Kenya about their leases. They own 43,000 hectares. And um, they, during their day, their heyday, they used to castrate men so that they cannot be productive and, and, and they could work on their plantations till, till death. They are still in existence right now. Uh, they're the ones who, who uh, produce macadamia nuts, avocado. Um, and you can see the daily is talking about why the decision in Kakuzi case could alter land laws because a UK court awarded the communities that live around Kakuzi some sort of token. And, but we are yet to know the leases. They have 26 leases, colonial era 1920, that we have no idea about. This is current, Kakuzi is still operating. They have the biggest, uh, the biggest contract from China to supply uh, avocados. Uh -huh. Let's move on, Lydia. There is the best titanium. It's operational in the coastal um, area where squatters are saying that they are getting a raw deal. Best titanium uh, um, has been operating and, and extracting um, uh, uh, tile mine. So it's also one of the multinationals that operate in the coastal area. And in this area, the education levels are too low. So um, the awareness is too low as well. Um, we continue, Lydia. Um, there's Lycopia right now in Kenya. There's some sort of conflict where people have died in Lycopia. And I've just tried to illustrate um, what the problem is. If you look at large scale ranches, they are owned by families that were awarded this lands in 1920, including Kuki Galman. Um, if you've watched a film, I think it's out of Africa. She's the biggest land owner in Kenya with 1 million hectares. And her um, family was given land in 1924. She still owns that land. And if you look at um, the Crown Ordinance of 1899, as I've not, I've, I've, I shared before, up to today, those large scale ranches own 90% of Laikipia, including uh, the lower ranch where most of the famous uh, who come to, 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 to participate in the annual mm -hmm. event. There's even, uh, uh, there's even one that goes around that uh, the royals have a portion of land in those areas in 2021 from 1899. Um, let's go on as I conclude. Um, as I conclude, I'm almost done. This is the second last um, slide, um, Eric. Let's share the other document so that I just show you what the Mau Mau reparation case um, is like. The Mau Mau reparation case is, is, is a unique case because the victims got to confront the perpetrators and negotiated an out of court settlement. The settlement was too little because each of the 5,228 victims only got around 340 shillings, that's 340 pounds. And some of them had been castrated. Some of them, uh, they had suffered enormous harm. They, they, are, they were maimed. So you can imagine 340 pounds, 50 years down the line. And this is the memorial that was part of the out-of-court settlement. The out-of-court settlement had three parts. A statement of regret from the then PM William William Hague, and then uh, this memorial and, 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 and those little tokens that I've just spoken about. So this document I've also shared, maybe Lydia can share it, um, can share it with, with whoever is interested, but it's a six page document that talks about the court case, the out of court settlement and how unfair it is, but the British kept touting it that, you know, this is a reconciliation document and, and this is what we can offer for now. So as I finish, I'd just like to talk about the bottlenecks. Why, why haven't we been able to address some of these issues? This is the last slide I promised. The multiplicity of laws, it is a colonial legacy where one issue land is, is uh, so many laws uh, affect one, one issue. Like you get um, in my country land, you can have like 50, 
40 pieces of policies and regulations that affect land and lay people cannot be able to trace the entitlement in all those policies that becomes a, red, a, a bottleneck. The national land restitution law and institutional framework is faulty. The enforcement is very poor. Absentee landlords in the coast, the Arabs allocated themselves very huge chunks of land and then they disappeared. So in essence, the, the, the indigenous who are still there are just squatters. So they're still living as squatters on their indigenous land because an ordinance made them uh, squatters back in 1899. Uh, sub successive regimes have never been able to address that in my country. Our president is a big, as among us, the biggest landowner. So they, 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 they are not in a rush to address some of those injustices. The repossession of illegally acquired land is provided for in the constitution, but no one has the guts to do that. And even if they, uh, they, they, they give such an award, the enforcement is still a challenge. And resolve historical land injustices is an issue that I have said all through my presentation. Abuse of power, like the previous presenter said, is still very real here. And um, it manifests when a um, government official knows because of the, of the office they, 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 they occupy that a project is going to pass here, what they do is speculate. So when they speculate, they buy from poor people land very cheaply and then sell it to multinationals very expensively, including the multinationals themselves can speculate. For enforcement of the law I've mentioned, and then of course there's a lack of awareness. Um, we are still talking about way forward. The way forward, um, since we are still in the same, um, situation. A way forward, of course, it's the law, the rule of law, and I hope that um, one day we are going to enjoy it. Thank you very much. Yuri. Well, thank you so much, Faith. And um, I mean, I, I see we can keep, we can go for another couple of hours and not finish this subject. Uh, uh, it's uh, such a passionate subject and um, uh, a, a very important one. Uh, we cannot have the Africa we want. We cannot um, uh, build, you know, this continent on a sustainable basis without dealing, without taking head on these kinds of problems, the problem of land, the problem of minerals, the problem of, um, of, um, uh, of uh, water uh, and uh, energy resources. These are things we need for the development of the continent. And as you, I think the, at the heart of it is the land issue. So I'll ask you one question and then we'll move on to um, uh, Professor Akwete, let me ask you, you know, you've, Kenya has suffered from this land problem, but so have so many other countries on the continent. What would be the two, one or two things, if you had to, if you, if you had other uh, African land uh, managers, what would you, what would you tell them from the Kenyan experience that ought to inform action at the continental level? I'll tell them two things. Number one, it's important for the communities to own their own struggle because you can only claim a right that you can identify and point out and organize better and claim it. So the communities have to own their own struggle. Number two, there needs to be measures that are put in place for non-repetition, because one of the key problems in Kenya is the repetition, the cyclic nature of the land injustices that happened in, in 1899, they are still happening in my country and across Africa for that matter. And then I think the issue of having very corrupt leaders who enrich themselves at the expense of, of their people, so I'd say also corruption is a cancer that just needs to be cut. Well, um, thank you so much, Faith. This is uh, really important. And I'm sure we're gonna come back to you with uh, quite a few questions. Uh, I can see quite a few you know, uh, in the chat room. So we will, uh, uh, let us give uh, the, our last speaker the chance to, 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 you know, to say something on, on fishing. That's a, an important issue. And then we'll come back with questions. There are lots of questions for you, Faith, for Alain, for uh, Nemo. So please just hang in there with us and um, I'll call on um, me, Professor Akwete, 
please you so much is in your head i don't know how much of it you can take out for this session but please it's over to you thank you so very much uh, um eric uh, and thank you everybody the adna team the um uh, accountability working group team and of course my, my fellow speakers, above all, the audience that is joining us. I wanna thank everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, just spend a little bit of time on this issue that normally in our lobby on Africa's behalf, something I've been doing for four decades, we haven't really focused on this. And it is the issue of plundering of the sea of people going to the sea and just taking out the wealth and trashing the place. And the first thing that I have to say is, it is not just an Africa-wide problem. When we put together this seminar, we thought, yes, uh, it, it's affecting Africa. And you know there are issues that because of Africa's special position as a former colonized uh, continent, Others were con uh, also colonized, but Africa got its independence the most recently. Certain issues are just special to us. I have to confess to you, I was very surprised to see that this is a global issue. And of all entities and of all stakeholders, the government of the United States, the federal government of the United States has declared that fishing is becoming a global issue, a global threat, a security threat, and they have attached a new name to it. It's a mouthful. They call it uh, IUU fishing. I for illegal, first U for unreported, second U for unregulated. So IUU fishing, if you Google it, you will see. And it is a huge issue everywhere, but it is particularly bad in Africa. I also want to commend particularly my sister. If you notice, she called me uh, big brother. When we talk on the, on the internet, she said, I'm gonna call you big brother. I said, okay, I'll call you wonderful sister. She did a great job. I wasn't able to put together my, uh, my uh, PowerPoint. This is where the first point of my, my, um, my apology because we've been uh, rushing to do this. But here is the key point. There are wonderful pictures, and we are going to have a follow-up and put these together. We have a ton of materials for people who are interested. We will direct them to it, so you'll be able to see pictures of what has been done to coastal communities all over the world, and particularly in Africa. So for now, I'm afraid that you have to just bear with me to paint a picture of three particular African countries where this issue has been big and we will provide the uh, visual evidence later. The first one is Angola. Um, what has happened in Angola and is that, of course, the fish are dwindling for three reasons. The, the two, first two reasons are important, but we want to put it aside for now. One of them is uh, that the seas are simply getting hotter and hotter. And of course, for any living creature, if things get too hot, you move to a cooler place. So the fish are moving from Angolan coast towards the uh, South Pole, which means they go past Namibia and more of the fish are moving to South Africa. A friend of mine said, well, yeah, they are climate uh, refugees. Uh, so you are getting less fish uh, where Angolans normally caught fish. Secondly, when the sea is that hot, it holds less oxygen. So even the fish that can tolerate warmer waters that stay, they are dying because they don't have enough oxygen. But the third whammy, the, the coup de grace, so to speak, is that then giant trawlers from all over the world come in and they scoop up all the fish using implements and nets and tools that are illegal. Uh, they do this under international law, coastal countries, unless there is two are close and they have to divide it, coastal countries have 200 kilometers of their coast is, is seen as uh, similar to their land. It belongs to them, the resources are theirs, foreigners cannot fish there without, cannot fish there without permission. But these giant trawlers, uh, trawlers come in and do this, 
I noticed that Dr. Nimobasi said that Shell is moving its oil operations farther and farther out to sea because they know they, they cannot be monitored. It's the same with their fishing because African countries don't have that large uh, um, navies. So when the fish have been pushed away by climate change, the little that is left, these giant trawlers come in and scoop it up. And guess who is number one? China. China has the most trawlers. They are scooping it up. The Angolan government is not doing much about it. And you can figure out the reason why, because Angola has a lot of resources, among them probably oil. They sell the oil to China and they get loans from China. And so it's like, well, we can't really yell at them for stealing our fish because then the loans they give us and the oil they buy from us, we will have problems with that. All of this has an impact on the uh, African communities, which is actually where we want to focus because fishing communities are suffering and you are talking to the son of a fisherman. I'll get to Ghana in a second. But Angola, you can see the evidence. There's a town in Angola called Tambwa. It is dying, absolutely dying because the fishermen and the families can't catch fish. So their livelihood is gone. Before I get to Ghana, I'm going to go northeast to Africa, uh, 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 the Horn of Africa, Somalia. Somalia has the la longest coast of any con uh, country on the African continent. It is uh, 3,400 kilometers. Somalia has gone through a lot of trauma, especially since 1991 when si Siad Bari was overthrown and left for exile in Nigeria and warlords took over the place. The US has played a big and to my mind, bad role in Somalia. The country is now has a weak central government where it looks like the only thing it controls is the capital uh, Mogadishu. And the impact is in the sea. Now I want everybody to think back to the first year that President Obama was in power uh, 2009. In April of that year, the first military order he gave uh, for people to go into action was to kill two Somali pirates. They had taken uh, um, hostage an American called Captain Phillips. Why did they do that? Because for 70 years, these uh, uh, foreign trawlers have been going to Somali waters and absolutely devastating the fish, stealing the fish that Somali fishermen catch. Um, it's as if they will come in. I mean, um, Alain spoke about uh, minerals. If these country people were coming in, at least on land, they have the courtesy of going to see the government and talk to them and sign fictitious papers. On the sea, nobody sees them. They just come and take the fish and the fishermen can't get anything and they can't feed their families. So Somalis, of course, got angry about it. Some of them said, okay, we are going to attack these trawlers. We are going to attack fish, uh, uh, other ships. And because of that, the West branded them as pirates. Of course, if you go to the movies, you see these funny movies about pirates from long ago and we love that. But in the 20th century, nobody loves uh, 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 pirates. And so they were killed, they were demonized, and a lot of uh, arms and ships came from all over, naval ships to say, we're going to kill the pirates. They did, but what they didn't do, what they haven't addressed is that they are still stealing Somalia's uh, fish. So Somali coast, uh, coastal communities are suffering. They can't feed their families. There is contention among them to see who catches the, the little bit of fish. And so you have Angola and you have Somalia. And then let me touch a little bit on Ghana, a place I know a little bit about. The same thing is happening in Ghana. Um, even beyond the uh, uh, trawlers are coming into the 200 kilometer um, um, sea lane that should be Ghana's exclusive uh, um, territory. They are catching the fish. There are two wrinkles that they are putting on the uh, uh, stealing of fish in Ghana. One is that a lot of the trawlers have actually been registered as being owned by Ghanaians, but you scratch the surface? No, they, uh, th those Ghanaians are not owning them. They are frontmen for the Chinese. Um, and they are catching a lot of fish 
and taking it away to sell in Europe or back to China. So the fishing uh, industry in Ghana has been devastated. Fishermen can't get fish. They go farther and farther. The artisanal fishermen can't get the fish. The other part of it is that research has shown that of all the African countries, Ghanaians, uh, for, for protein in their diet, Ghanaians depend on fish more than anybody else. Some of the protein comes from, of course, plants and from animals, but for Ghanaians, about 60% of the animal protein comes from, 60% uh, comes from fish and they are catching less fish. So it's causing nutritional problems. It has devastated families. I talked to my family, my extended family, and people can't send their children to school because of this. And, what the Chinese trawlers also do in Ghana is something called psycho fishing because the international law says, okay, it's not that um, um, big countries can't send trawlers to fish. They have to fish in the right waters and they have to catch the right fish. They can catch things like tuna. They can catch fish, things like swordfish, but smaller fish like sardines and others Look, only locals are allowed to catch them. Well, in the Ghanaian waters, the Chinese trawlers and also uh, some from Thailand and a, a few, some also from the European Union, they are catching these fish, which they are not supposed to catch, freezing them and then saying to the Ghanaian local artisans, uh, uh, fishermen, well, we'll sell that to you. They have been selling it to them. So you buy it frozen from the Chinese trawlers and then you take it to land and sell. And of course, it's not enough for them to maintain a living, but this is what they are doing. And it is against the law. It is devastating the fish. The fish can't reproduce. Of course, the Ghanaian government has to do something about this. Like the Angolan government, they are not speaking up much. And some people have said, well, yeah, look at their relationship with the Chinese government. They have had a big bauxite agreement and they have taken loans for that. So once again, it's like, well, we can't really say much about what they are doing in, um, in, the, in the seas because it might jeopardize our bigger relations with them. Two other quick points. So Ghanaian civil society have actually been pushing and one of the elements done was, okay, they are going to put inspectors on those big trawlers to make sure that they are catching the right fish and using the right equipment. Well, of course, you can see that the, the, these um, big trawlers that are breaking the law down one prying eyes. They have disappeared at least one inspector. His family has not heard from him. The case has been about 10 months now. He has disappeared. The, the fish, um, the trawler owner say, well, we don't know what happened to him. So one of the um, arguments now is um, the African Union and these coastal countries, they should push for remote controlled cameras on these trawlers so that they stop uh, um, uh, stealing the fish, but and they can be seen what they are doing and they will, no other family will have to go through what the Ashan family in Ghana has been going to. And in reading all this research, one other final point, and, and then I'll pause there, that has struck me is this, and it's actually the title of my, th this talking point, which I'm working into an essay, it is um, um, IUU fishing, illegal, uh, unre unregulated, unreported fishing, colon, Africa plundered and then blamed. Because when you look at the FAO, when you look at the European Union, when you look at China, when you look at all these big countries that send their trawlers into a lot of places, and I should say, like as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not just Africa, but it's particularly bad in Africa. Um, Agnes' friend Aldo said to me, nee, it's happening in Argentina too. It's happening in South America too. But in Africa, when I'm reading the report, these big countries say to Africa, including the European Union, they say, well, we blame the Ghanaians. Well, we blame the Angolans. Well, we blame the Somalis. If they didn't have corruption, there will be no stealing of fish. That is true. But the question that some people are asking, some young kids I was talking to, they said, wouldn't it be easier if these big countries will stop their trawlers to go thousands of miles from China into Ghanaian waters, Somali waters, and Angolan waters to do it. So 
They are sending their ships, they are taking the fish, and then they blame the Africans. And my final piece, which is actually an apology, Ghana, Somalia, Angola, they are not the only countries suffering the most. In fact, one of the big countries suffering a lot that is also trying to fight back is Senegal. Just my apologies that in trying to do my research, I ran out of time on Senegal, but we will do this again. I want to thank you, Eric, and thank everyone, and I'm ready for questions and discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ni. Nee. Thank you, um, uh, everyone. And uh, I think we're now moving into the next phase of this discussion, which is actually opening up the field to um, all participants to, to ask questions. I started off by talking about the, um, the African continental free trade area, which um, will ultimately have Africans looking inwards, you know, creating the markets, the wealth, and the jobs that they need. Uh, so the AFCFTA, which, which we are called the African Single Market, is in our future. It's in our future. And we've got to work to get there. Now, the question I have for all the panelists is, from your perspective, from fishing, and I'm going to start with fishing, so I'll inverse the, the process. From fishing, what do we need to do to capture that market, the processes, and bring that back to the continent as we try to build this continental single market. I'll have me speak, and then I'll go to land. Uh, I hope you're there, Faith, to tell us, give us some ideas on what we need to do. We're becoming as concrete as we can. And I'll go on to minerals, and then I'm hoping that uh, uh, Dr. Bassi is there. Uh, Nemo, I'll come to you uh, at the end of the process. Let me start with uh, me. What do we do in the um, Africa um, um, single market? I think you're absolutely right. It's a great achievement, but it's on paper. Now we have to make it work. And yes, the um, exactly what it's supposed to do is to make sure that Africa's resources are properly controlled and traded so that the, the funds are used for the benefit of Africans. Now, I, again, my, my three preceding fellow speakers have been wonderful. I feel like I'm in, uh, uh, in over my head. Um, I learned in particular, I don't, my French is not very good, but I got the gist of it. And he kept mentioning the African diaspora. And I love that where he said diaspora, I will say Adna, because I want us Adna to look in the mirror. Uh, and I'm tying the two together. What can be done? When I look at the fishing problem, I think there is a lot that we can get the government that we now live under. Yes, uh, Adna is in several places, not just Washington, all over the US, Canada, uh, in Africa. But yes, we are heavily concentrated in the United States. We live under the government of the United States. Our job is to lobby the government of the United States to have proper policies towards Africa. And when you look at the IUU fishing, there is so much that we must work with the US government to do. So my answer is, the first point is for ADNA to engage with the Congress, engage with the Biden administration and any other administration and say, okay, you are now turning on illegal fishing. By the way, the, the two, three words are a mouthful. So I substitute catastrophic fishing, catastrophic fishing. We can work with the United States to change its policy, to make sure that uh, big trawlers. In my research, I didn't see U.S. trawlers being some of the um, um, culprits, so to speak. Maybe there are some I haven't done enough of the research. Most of the culprit uh, trawlers are coming from countries like the European Union. I mean, the European Union is a collection of countries and China. The U.S. can use its power and its laws and its sanctions to make sure that these trawlers stop breaking the law and they can help the Africa Union do that and they can help the Africa Union insert this element of sort of protecting the fishing resources into the implementation of the Africa single market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ni, I will go on to the 
uh, to, to land. That was the second uh, in line. Um, uh, Faith, any thoughts, ideas for uh, what we can do as a continent, you know, to tap into, uh, overcome the problems we have with land management? Yes, I'd like to suggest like one or two um, um, interventions we can do. Number one, I think one of the biggest problems that we are facing is the transnational um, crimes, the, 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 the cross-border crime that are being perpetrated by multinationals. And the multinationals are a government unto themselves. They militarize their installations so that they have their own small army in a certain area. Then they can be able to influence political um, processes. So if there is a way we can link struggles so that uh, whatever East Africa is going through is what Southern Africa is going through, is what Western Africa is going through, we should come together and link struggles at all levels, local level, because at times you get that the language that we use in certain spaces at international and regional level cannot be used at local level. While the local level um, uh, struggle is the, is the, at the wheels, it is the, 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 for lack of a better word, it's why, it's the reason why uh, certain processes can be very successful. So we need to simplify the discussion so that the linking of struggles can be easier. And then number two is for us to develop simple tools that can be owned by any person who wants, understands the discourse to facilitate accountability. Um, if I might borrow from the Kenyan uh, context, 70% um, of our lands are unregistered with such fluid uh, uh, tenure. Um, anything can be done to such land. They do not have anybody to be accountable to as long as they can afford money to put electric fence around a piece of land, they are good to go. So there is need to develop um, IC materials or tools that can be scorecards even for uh, my grandmother in the village to know that this process has six steps. And out of the six, three have been skipped. Why are we skipping this, these three steps? So that if every other voice is asking accountability questions from the local, national, regional, international uh, level, I think that issue of land grabbing would, would, would be tamed. Because um, I, I always hold the opinion that um, the rule of law um, is a political process, especially in some countries. Um, the law is not absolute, and if right claimants cannot demand for their rights, then um, agents of impunity have their field day. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you so much, uh, Faith. That's wonderful. Uh, let me see uh, if Alan, Alan, are you there? I yes, it looks like Alan. Is. Alan? You know, he's on the road and he may, we may have lost him. Or um, is, okay, uh, Dr. Bassi? If they, well, whilst we try to reconnect with them, and I hope we do, uh, because uh, Alain has been in and just uh, we just lost him again. Um, I have got a few questions here for the two uh, that we have, uh, um, Professor Akwete and Miss um, Alube, uh, Faith. Um, how, I'll, I'll ask both of you the same question. How can African civil society, do you have any ideas on how we can pull African civil societies, you know, come pull them together, bring them to a common purpose of you know, trying to deal with these issues. Do you have any thoughts on that, uh, Faith? Yes, we can pull together. Um, I'd say the issue of scarce resources has promoted unhealthy competition, even among us ourselves, thus fragmenting the discussion. So we need to find a way of resourcing uh, the movement, um, human resource and, and funding in such a way that um, we, we leverage on our strength. 
So the coming together should be very clear and say structured uh, networks are not ideal, but I think if everybody can look at themselves in, in, in a struggle, then it is easy to engage rather than having uh, fluid ways of, of engaging. And then uh, the, the funding is, is, is thinning, okay? The African Civil Society, we are almost all of us are struggling with the funding. We need to be more innovative in how uh, we sustain movements. Um, we know, like for instance, in the land justice uh, agenda that our enemy is rich, um, very connected. The multinationals have deep pockets and they've been around for such a long time. So there is an element that cannot just be handled by resources. There is need for commitment and better organizing on the part of the African CSOs. Mm. Um, me? Do we have, don't tell me we've lost Professor Akweti too. Oh, no, you haven't. Uh, okay. I, think I, I may be muted. Let me unmute myself. Right, please. You, you, you are unmuted now. Yes, you're fine. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I can hear you fine. I heard Faith fine. I think your answer is great. And very much along the same lines, uh, uh, basically what I drilled from her, I, I extracted from her last answer is, joining forces. Because, you know, I like to think that of all the challenges that Africa faces, particularly in the area of resources, the core, the core of our problem is these are not uh, events out of nature, okay? It's not like the rainfall or, or other things that are just happening. These are the actions of actors people are taking our resources. And the point is those who take our resources, they have a network, they are connected. So we who are losing the resources, one of the weaknesses we need to shore up is we, to defend our resources, we must network. By which I mean, um, you know, of course, ADNA is a major civil society uh, network in the United States focused on Africa we need to strengthen our relationship with civil society on the ground in Africa. We need to do that. And even on this issue of looking at um, uh, the plundering of our resources, I don't mind telling you, you know, I'm a member of the accountability working group. I'm also a member of the, actually I chair the security working group and the stealing of our resources is actually a security issue. Because if our governments are too poor because the resources have been stolen, they cannot have the money to produce to do the things that the government should do. And that leads to conflict, that leads to neglect, that leads to populations of young men joining terrorist groups. Um, you don't want to get me going on security issues in Africa. But the point is, this is a security issue as well. So if we focus on it, if we link it up with security, I mean, um, civil society in Africa, then we are working so that those taking our resources, as Faith said, they have been working together for, for decades, even generations. We, the defenders, need to strengthen our uh, connections. And the final bit is this. When we were thinking of doing this, it actually arose out of, I'm sure many of the people in our audience and even on our organizing committee, we have in mind IFF, illicit financial flows. The United Nations has uh, documented this, the European Union has documented this, and the African Union had former President uh, Thabo Mbeki lead a study to study uh, uh, this, and they all come up with that. As we speak, every year, 100 billion US dollars, and that is billion with B, US dollars leave our continent. That's money that our governments and our, uh, our citizens and our private corporations don't have because they are being taken illegally. They are being stolen from Africa. Now, and we thought, we have shone a light on it twice in this very working group. But we thought, don't think that 
this 100 billion is sitting in a bag in Africa and somebody comes and snatches it up. So this focus on how the continent is plundered is actually for us to say, this is how the illicit financial flows, the 100 billion a year, this is how it begins leaving the continent. They are not snatching dollars out of Africa. They are snatching the diamonds, the oil, the gas. And as Dr. Bassi focused, not only are they stealing the wealth, but they leave dangerous poisons behind. One last point, uh, part of my research in moving off of uh, to renewable um, um, energy, people are talking about electric cars. You need special batteries. To make that, you need special minerals. They are, once again, converging in a lot of areas in Africa, including DRC, Congo. And they are using poisonous methods so that women in Congo right now are having babies with birth defects because their waters are being polluted by the new forms of mining. But in any case, the point is, I agree, um, one step is for ADNA and other NGOs in the, uh, in the developed countries. I said we should pressure our government. We also need to strengthen our links with civil societies on the continent. Thanks very much, Prof. We, um, we're having a lot of questions coming in and unfortunately the two of you would have to um, uh, fill in for the others. Uh, uh, if you can, no pressure. Uh, and we're, we're moving towards the end of the program also, so I uh, won't put you under a lot of um, uh, stress. No, one question is, what is being done to inform the African diaspora? This is something I'm sure you can handle, uh, Prof. Uh, what is being done to inform the African diaspora? Um, and this is a question from uh, Paula Queen. And um, I'll ask prior to you, just before you, 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 you step in, I want to, I want, um, uh, uh, faith to also be reflecting on the issue of um, how other parts of the world have have addressed the land problem. I'm sure you've had time to look into this. Um, and what can Africa do differently? So first, uh, uh, need to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the question of how is the diaspora informing itself about these issues on the continent, I think it's a great question. I think actually there are some issues where I think the diaspora, and as I like to call us, because the diaspora itself, you can see sections of it. One section of it is um, what I call African immigrants. Those of us born on the continent but now make our home here in the, in the developed world, the United States to be exact. That segment of the diaspora, one of the things that we do do is we keep very much in close contact with our people back home. We send home a lot of money. In fact, it's been uh, said that the money sent uh, privately to families exceeds official development assistance and one way of pulling it. And I don't wanna, I think our moderator is doing a great job, but he and I have been friends for a long time. So I hope I'm not sharing no secrets by saying that he, he once hung his hat at the World Bank, so he knows these issues. And so we send uh, uh, those monies back. And of course we talk to people all the time. I talk to people in Ghana, maybe four or five times a week, you know? So we, we use those private channels, but my point, so we are doing some of that. However, we need to shift gears. It's not enough. Even on the money side, I know that um, immigrant groups from um, uh, Nigeria and particularly Ethiopia, they are getting together and pulling together their money. I'm saying we also need to raise our game when it comes to the communication. It shouldn't be just phone calls. We would need to organize better. And I was saying my first, very first answer that where Alain says diaspora, I say ADNA. So I am throwing a challenge to my old group ADNA, but I'll give a shout out to ADNA. This um, webinars that we have been doing and a lot of issues, Pan-Africanism, um, on COVID, on illicit financial flows, and now on resource extraction, it is a way of raising the game. So how are we spreading the word? This is one way, this webinar is one way of spreading the word. And please let me tell you finally, this is not a one-off. 
you will be hearing from us again. We will do, be doing more of this. Thank you. Eric, your mic is off. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, over yes. to you. I'll try to get to Alan. I hear he's back. So. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'll respond to your question. I've, I've, I've thought about it. I'm thinking we are, um, we are underdogs uh, in this conversation. Um, uh, Every other country that organizes well around, especially land justice issues, and I've been trying to to think the model um, country in Africa that can say they've gotten their land um, their land governance processes in order and they don't have issues. Um, I'd say there are some that are just better than others, but there is none that can say they have their land uh, questions answered because um, it was designed like that. Because we land that has clear, clear governance systems, then the agents of impunity cannot plunder. In the confusion, they can do so much because the tenure is fluid across Africa, even in some countries. Um, there are some practices that even promote such uh, plunder uh, unashamedly. So um, what can be done? Um, we have laws. Even in Kenya, we have very beautiful pieces of legislation. The enforcement is the problem. And the enforcement um, is not... Um, I guarantee even with good laws that uh, land justice can be actualized. Um, we had hoped that uh, we'd learn from the example of South Africa with the TRC and, and you know, appreciate the process of writing past wrongs. But that process was not also as perfect as, as we had hoped that it's going to give us a good precedent. In Kenya, we had the TGRC and we had so many versions of that report and then it was put in a, on a shelf somewhere. So I'd say um, it's a conversation that we need to, to think through. I don't think the agents of impunity have let Africans deal with their land questions and develop their own uh, uh, solutions uh, because uh, the plunder has to go on according to some quarters. <laughs> Alan came and left. I don't know if he does come back because I know the road is on and uh, uh, the network must be fairly tricky, you know, uh, in that part of uh, uh, the there. country. Alan is there. Alan is back. Yes. Fantastic. Alan, I'm going to ask you uh, to, I'll try to frame a question that wraps up all of this. How can we have African countries, they tend to work in silos and we're unable, and this question came from someone in the audience, uh, working in silos, Africans can, it appears, never address successfully the issues of whether it's minerals or fishing or any of the issues we are talking about. So there's need for some continental approach to addressing these issues. Is that your thinking, Alain? And do you think our leaders are in a in the mindset for, 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 for moving on in that direction. Je pense que euh, il faut rendre, il faut dire la vérité de nos dirigeants. Les dirigeants d'aujourd'hui ne sont pas ceux d'hier. Ils sont peut-être pas brillants, mais ils sont plus ceux d'hier. Quand vous regardez les dirigeants africains aujourd'hui, ils sont pas nombreux. Les vieux de, 50, de 80 ans et de 90 ans, <rire> suivez mon regard. Et ils ont envie, <rire> ils ont envie que les choses changent. Seulement, voilà, ils sont dans un environnement qui est encore vicié. Et je pense que il ne faut pas que nous commettions la même erreur que l'ensemble de nos aînés qui ont toujours écouté ce que les médias disent de nos dirigeants. C'est-à-dire, on met tout le monde dans le même sac. Il y a des bons, il y a des mauvais. C'est à nous de travailler avec les bons. Et ça existe. Pour la transformation de notre continent, 
il faut que nous ayons le courage de dire on va travailler avec tel et ne pas dire tous nos dirigeants sont des voleurs, c'est faux. C'est absolument faux. Il faut que nous fassions le choix de dire de l'intérieur comme de l'extérieur, oui, on peut composer avec tel, oui, on peut composer avec tel, oui, comme, voilà comment on peut construire notre industrie avec tel ou tel. Moi, je vais dire les choses, ça va choquer un certain nombre de personnes. Un Maki Sal ou un Anna Akufo n'a rien à voir avec les vieux que nous avions jusqu'à maintenant. Et c'est des gens qui ont été à l'école, qui étaient même de la diaspora, comme vous et moi ou comme ceux qui sont sur le continent, qui n'étaient pas mauvais. Ils ne se lèvent pas un matin en disant « je vais faire une carrière de dictateur ». Ils se retrouvent dans une situation. Maintenant, moi j'insiste sur quelque chose qui est fondamental. Je sors peut-être de ta question, euh, euh, Eric. La question est de savoir comment on se met en ordre de bataille pour construire des choses. Et on ne commence pas par le plus gros, on commence par des petites choses. Le secteur minier est vaste, parce qu'on est riche d'un secteur minier sur le continent. Demain, Félix Tshisekedi ne dira pas, on n'a pas vu quelqu'un arriver. Vous n'étiez pas là quand on était en train de donner des mines, quand on était en train de donner des terrains miniers. Nous, diaspora, on parle beaucoup, on parle beaucoup. On est les premiers contributeurs de ce pays-là. Nous sommes les vrais financiers de ce pays. Eric, tu le sais, nous donnons deux fois l'aide au développement à nos pays. Mais si c'est l'aide au Western Union, ça ne sert à rien. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on ne monte pas une structure pour aller au pays dire, voilà, donnez-nous ce secteur minier, nous allons l'exploiter et faire la transformation sur place. Nous allons faire des batteries électriques sur place au Congo. Nous voulons que ce soit avec nous que Tesla négocie. Pourquoi on ne fait pas ça Pourquoi on se contente de toujours critiquer l'autre La position de critique est trop facile. Une fois, on a compris. Deux fois, on a un peu plus compris. Trois fois, ça devient fatigant. Construisons des consortiums, construisons des multinationales et allons à la quête de ces richesses-là sur le continent. Arrêtons les discours. Mmh. En France, on a assisté il y a quelques semaines à l'idée de création d'un fonds africain qui va investir en Afrique Sachant que le fonds, le statut juridique du fonds est important, ça permet de bien gérer les choses. On a du mal à créer ces fonds-là. Parce que dès que vous dites à un Africain, apportez telle somme, il préfère s'acheter une, une image auprès de sa famille en envoyant l'argent au pays pour qu'on nourrisse les enfants. Mais à aucun moment il s'est dit, si j'avais investi ça dans un secteur, ça produirait de l'argent pour qu'il y ait de vrais hôpitaux sur place en Afrique. J'insiste sur ce discours au point d'être fatigant. Et il faut que ce soit traduit dans les termes. Je ne veux pas le dire en anglais, mais je pense qu'on peut le traduire très clairement. Créons ah. des entreprises. Arrêtons de gémir. Allons à la conquête comme les autres entreprises viennent sur le continent. Vous êtes américain. Si vous créez un fonds aux États-Unis, les États-Unis vont vous soutenir de la même façon qu'ils soutiennent certaines firmes. Allez à la conquête de la, de, 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 du DRC, allez à la conquête de la Centrafrique, prenez des mines, faites la transformation sur place. Voilà. Merci Alain, parce que nous n'avons pas beaucoup de temps, j'aimerais bien que Cathy traduise ces grandes idées que tu viens de, de mettre. Cathy, can you quickly uh, capture the essence of what Alain has said? Yeah, he said a lot of things. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will start with the end because it was thing at the end that we should stop complaining and we should start acting and taking, I mean, action, moving into the direction of taking ownership of our own development in Africa, that people should, instead of sending money to Western Union, to Africa for, to help their families, they should instead, I mean, he was suggesting that people should, the diaspora can create companies, can set up a, a, a fund. Uh, in Africa in order to invest into our own development. 
Uh, at the beginning, he stated that uh, uh, leaders in Africa are no longer the same as the, uh, the past generation of leaders that we used to have. They are much more younger and they are much more informed or aware of what is happening on the continent, but they are also working uh, in, a, in a vicious environment. So we should not, he was advising us not to put all of them in the same, in the same box. They are not all thieves. Uh, inside and out, he said, we should, we should try to deal with the best of them we should try to look at who among those leaders is close to this kind of action and work with these leaders, the, the, the few of them who are ready to, to work. It, it was asking uh, when and how from here, from a webinar like this, are we, are we gonna get uh, and move forward uh, and take small actions, small things, start with small things, because he, he thinks that the diaspora is one of the biggest contributors uh, to African countries right now. So his position is just to, to raise again awareness in the diaspora and ask the diaspora to, to stand as one, as united and create maybe a structure like a company or a fund in order to, uh, to get that ownership uh, we are talking about, the mining sector, especially in our, in our continent. Alain? Yeah, uh, I, think you, you, I think you captured the yeah, essence. Okay. Alain said. Uh, Alain, je, je vais, enfin, je vais, permettez-moi, je vais appeler uh, uh, Bassi, qui est là, Dr. Bassi. Um, are you there? And if you're there, we, we have lots of questions, but let me try to capture all of this in one. How did the Middle East, the countries in the Middle East, uh, oil and gas, and why can't Africa do that? What can Africa do to, as a, as a, from the continental perspective to tap into its oil and gas resources? <laughs> Hello. All right. That seems like a simple question, but I'm here. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. We it are. It seems like a, it seems like a simple question, but it's actually very complex. Yes. Um, I, I think one at one level, trying to trying to wonder if we can replicate what the Middle East have done with crude oil, that Africa could do the same thing. Uh, is, is a very, it's is a different, uh, I think it's a complex discussion that we could have. Uh, some people have even said that the, the not used oil, coal, and gas to be right now. The world uh, is, according to what countries said they're going to do with regard to climate change, the world is likely going to have a temperature increase on the average of 2.7 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. If that happens, we're not going to talk about development anywhere in the world. The world is going to have more cataclysmic uh, floods and storms and hurricanes and cyclones and all our coastal cities. That we are very, it's unfortunate that all, are we going to survive if we same pathway that caused the problem? I think we have to look differently from, from, from this resource, no matter what the resource did for other regions. Um, we, we need to actually look at the fact that we cannot, under the current objective conditions, pursue a pathway that is destructive. Uh, okay, and Nima, can you go in the direction of, uh, and if you can do this in a minute, because we're literally close to the end, can you go in the direction of Alain Foucault and tell us how we can, it may not be oil and gas, it could be solar energy, but we have all of these things in abundance. How can we as a continent, uh, do you have one or two ideas that could impulse change in that direction, help us move in the direction of, a, of continental action maybe? Uh, right. Um, I, I think the first thing for us to do is to we just have to simply have a totally altered mindset. We are still being dictated to on a lot of things and coloniality is still very predominant on the continent. So we need to agree that we can do things by ourselves. And look at you said this yourself. Look at the resources that we have. I, I believe this is a major shift that is needed. We're still, we're still following arguments that are obviously rigged against us. 
and we are following uh, technologies that are against so in our food production. Imagine Africa, so we are the uh, center of Nigeria is center of origin of beans, cowpea, and now we are allowing um, modern agricultural gen genetic engineering to bring in species, genetically engineered beans in the center of origin. This is what Mexico has been fighting with the US about maize. Uh, so there are things that we just simply need to do for ourselves, considering our self-interest. We have the brains, we have the brilliance, we have the knowledge. Let's pick on the things that we have that have not been adulterated. And the world is going to come for that. And we can make all the money we want and lead the world in how to live in conjunction, in harmony with nature, which is a pathway to the future. <laughs> thank you from your lips to God's ears. And uh, thank you, uh, Nemo. Thank you, Alan Foucault, for, you know, in spite of the difficulties, you're moving around, you've been able to uh, stay with us uh, through the program. So we're virtually at the end. My, I have the difficult task. I'll have either somebody say the last word, but it is, I have to thank all who contributed to this and then we'll come to the, uh, to the last word. Um, first of all, the panelists, you've done an amazing job and uh, uh, we thank you. Our interpreter, Kathy, thank you so much. And all who attended and participated, um, on the extraction web uh, uh, seminar, there was a uh, knee, of course, who delivered, but uh, uh, Bonnie Holcomb and Abel Wallendom, Mireille, uh, uh, Diepe, uh, Father Bartholomew, Bazemo, Aldo Kalileri, and, um, and uh, Effie Kembon. Uh, thank you. I'm just, you know, uh, uh, reading out your names without any you know, without explaining who exactly, what exactly uh, the roles you played, but we want to express our gratitude to you all. All the members of the Accountability Working Group of um, ADNA, uh, the Advocacy Network for Africa, uh, the chair, of course, Jacques Bahati, uh, Muiza Mutali, my friend, brother, uh, Imani Countess, Pauline um, Muchina, and Mary Uera, thank you all so much. Uh, the technical support that came from, um, that was provided by Lydia Andrews uh, of uh, the AFJN, and also uh, Leons Dimina, uh, Lambert, Lambert, Lambert Mbom, my brother, Muiza again, uh, and Albert Yan. Um, well, the, 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 the webinar host was, uh, of course, uh, uh, Jacques Baiti, Lydia Andrews, who's, who's been the web coordinator, Lydia Andrews, thank you, and Father Aniedi Okure. Um, there were some additional sponsors uh, from uh, sponsorships from uh, Torture Abolition and Survival Support Coalition, the TASSC, the African Bridge Building Project, and uh, the American Friends uh, Service uh, Committee. I hope I've mentioned everybody who contributed in one way or the other to the success of this um, event. I will have, and I believe it's only uh, normal that I do this, two people say a goodbye word and I'll decide who goes first. I want me to say something and I want Jack to say something. Uh, Jack, you open this up. So I guess me should say something and then we'll come to you to close it up. Your, your microphone, me. Or someone should unmute you. I okay. should. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm actually stunned because, um, of oh, course, yeah. uh, I didn't, so you. I, I didn't know come that. Here. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, Eric. I want to thank everybody, all the people that um, um, our moderator mentioned. I am actually very surprised. I didn't know this was going to come to me. I've been at the heart of organizing this uh, with my colleagues and I've actually been very busy, so I didn't have all these graphics. And I thought I knew every piece of it that would go, but I did not know I was going to be thrown into the deep end like this. So I will just say thank you, thank you, thank you, and a special thank you because of all the people mentioned, one person has not been thanked. And that is 
our fantastic moderator, Eric Chinye. I have known him since the 80s when we, I was working at Transafrica and he was already a seasoned journalist. And I think you will agree with me that he has done a great job. Of course, I thank all my colleagues at um, uh, ADNA and the uh, um, Accountability Working Group for all the great work they did. And everybody, I thank you very much. If I start mentioning uh, names, I will forget some, but I really appreciate this. And this is not the last one. Thank you, everyone. And especially thank you, Eric. Yeah. Um, thanks, Prof. And uh, we'll give the last word now to Jacques, uh, since you opened the seminar. And as you, as you, as you take the, uh, the floor, uh, Jacques, or the microphone, please remember there's a major challenge. What can the diaspora do? If you can, in your final words, I mean, Alain Foucault emphasized this, and I think everybody else, uh, Faith and the others, if you can, in your last words, just hint on what you guys, we all can do to, to, to advance the process. Over to you, Jacques. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to say that the Africa we have now is not the Africa we are dreaming to have meaning the Africa we want. But this seminar today is to begin or to continue the path forward to reach the Africa that we want. Major questions have been raised. Alain Foucault and the rest of the panelists have presented the problems. We have many people who can do this work. We have shown that we can do it. Look at our hospitals here in America. They are full of Africans and they are rated among the best. We need the conditions, the best conditions for us to go back and um, provide the leadership that we need. We have the challenge of security, but also we have the issue of governance. I will personally think that the ideas are there, but we need people to rise up. If someone feels like they have the guts to really stand up and be the shining light to lead us uh, in areas of invest, investing, because we want to give our money to people who are trustworthy. We have seen in many countries, government start, start uh, biz, uh, uh, government companies, and then they are led by friends, girlfriends, and then they talk. We have lost faith in those kinds of initiatives. We need to begin and bring trust to the forefront. So I want to really thank uh, uh, everyone in doing this. And before I do that, I just have to mention that. We, in Cameroon, there was a deal by an American company, Heracles Farms, paying $5 for one hectare, uh, leasing it for, for 99 years, uh, renewable ones. That is the kind of issues we need also to push back against. The theft of our resources is across the board. Their collaborators on the continent have to be dealt with. So the fight is on many fronts, but complaining will not do it. That's why we thank you all for being engaged. So the Africa Advocacy Network thanks everyone for their engagement, for their interest. And I want to personally thank you, uh, Eric, uh, for uh, leading us uh, into this exercise. We have seen that it is possible to talk a little bit and act a little more, and the results can be really shown. The Africa Faith and Justice Network in its project in Africa has done just that. Conferences for conference sake is no longer the approach. We do this, we speak a little bit with interested people and they go and we show the results. So I believe and I hope that we can take this direction and um, get things done. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, uh, uh, Bonnie, Bonnie just wants me to remind all of you, Bonnie Holcomb, that uh, the, uh, this program has been recorded and it will be available and uh, would, they'll include a set of photos and resources that you can use. So please watch out for that. And I hope you can use it 
And I'm sure I'm definitely certain we will be together again before long, thanks to the same team that put this together. Thank you very much and have a good end of the week.